Introduction to Quantum Information Processing Welcome to Lecture 9. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to compute the Fourier transform efficiently when the modulus is a power of 2. We first saw the Fourier transform in Lecture 8. Here's a quick reminder. The Fourier transform modulo m is this m by m matrix where omega is a primitive mth root of unity, that is, it's of the form e to the 2 pi i over m. It's useful to visualize the powers of omega as points in the complex plane. They are m equally spaced points on the unit circle, and here's what they look like when m is 8. A couple of simple observations that will prove useful. If omega is a 2 to the nth root of 1, then omega to the 2 to the n minus 1 is minus 1. So, for example, for the 8th root of unity, if you take omega to the 4th, you get minus 1. Also, if omega is a 2 to the nth root of unity, then omega squared is a 2 to the n minus 1th root of unity. In the example, omega squared is a 4th root of unity. For a in Zm, that is, a between 0 and m minus 1, applying Fm to ket a results in this state, which is a uniformly weighted superposition with phases being the powers of omega to the a. This state is frequently referred to as a Fourier basis state. And here's F star m applied to ket a. It looks similar except the phases are negative powers of omega. In the special case where m is of the form 2 to the n, the Fourier transform is a unitary operation acting on n qubits. There are very general results to the effect that any n qubit unitary operation can be implemented with 2 qubit gates, but in general order 4 to the n 2 qubit gates are required. Of course, that's exponentially many gates. That's not useful for our purposes, because we're interested in what can be computed efficiently. Theoretically, that means a polynomial number of gates. And in order to have a chance of being practical, the polynomial should not be too large. For example, if the number of gates is a polynomial of degree 500, well, that would not be of much use. I'm going to show you a fairly simple quantum circuit consisting of order n squared gates for the Fourier transform f2 to the n. Let's get started. I'd like to begin with a question. Are Fourier basis states entangled, or are they product states? These are n qubit states, so it makes sense to ask whether or not the individual qubits in this state are entangled. Let me write out the Fourier basis state for the n equals 3 case, which is dimension 8. The question is whether or not these three qubits are in an entangled state. Recall that when we have a uniform superposition of computational basis states with phases, it can go either way. For example, this first two qubit state is a product state whereas the second two-qubit state is entangled. That extra minus one makes a huge difference. So, which way does it go for this three-qubit state? Now, please pause the video to think this question over. Okay, so you may have noticed that you can factor out the first qubit from the first half of the terms, and the second half of the terms like so. And the state of the other qubits is the same for both cases. So the first qubit is in this product state with the rest of the qubits. And you can do something similar for the next qubit. So the answer to the question is that each Fourier basis state is actually a product of one qubit states. In general, a Fourier basis state looks like this. Look at the rightmost qubit. Its state is ket0 plus omega to the a ket1. The next qubit going left is 
cat zero plus omega to the two a cat one, then omega to the four a, omega to the eight a, and so on. Now, our quantum circuit for computing the Fourier transform is going to make use of this structure. Remember that if we construct a linear operator that matches what the Fourier transform does on all of the computational basis states, then it must be the Fourier transform. For concreteness, we're going to focus on the example F8. So A is a 3-bit binary string. And this is the expression for F8 applied to the computational basis state ket A. Let's start with the first qubit. Ket 0 plus omega to the 4 ket 1. What's omega to the 4 when omega is an 8th root of unity? Yes, omega to the 4 is minus 1. So we can simplify the expression to ket 0 plus minus 1 to the a ket 1. Note that this is the ket plus state when a is an even number and the ket minus state when a is an odd number. Let's look at the binary digits of a. Here's a table showing the correspondence between the numbers 0 to 7 and their 3-bit binary representations. I'm referring to the low order bit as a0. A number is even if a0 is 0, and odd if a0 is 1. So we can write our leftmost qubit like so, just in terms of the low order bit. And notice that this is the Hadamard of ket a0. So that's a pretty simple expression for the leftmost qubit. Just apply a Hadamard gate to one of the input qubits. Now let's look at the remaining qubits. Let's refer to the state of the remaining qubits as ket psi, or just psi for short. What does this state look like? Does it look like a Fourier basis state for F4? It kind of does. Let me pose the question to you. Is psi equal to F4 of ket A? Please pause to think about this. The answer is, not exactly. On the top line is F4 of A, and on the bottom line is Psi. You can see the superficial resemblance. But F4 is with respect to a 4th root of unity, not an 8th root of unity. We'll use this other Greek letter to denote the primitive 4th root of unity. Omega is reserved for the 8th root of unity. Another difference is that F4 acts on two qubits. So it's not the same A as in Psi, which is a three-bit string. It will be fruitful to explore in more detail the difference between the two expressions. Let's see what these expressions look like in terms of the three digits of A, which are A0 for the low-order digit, A1 for the middle digit, and A2 for the high-order digit. Suppose we take F4 to the two higher order digits, namely to ket A2, A1. In the exponent, I've surrounded the binary representations by square brackets so that they can be clearly read. The two-digit number in the square brackets is either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now, if we take the primitive eighth root of unity and square it, then we get the primitive fourth root of unity. So we can substitute omega squared for that other Greek letter. The substitution of omega squared leaves us with an extra factor of 2 in the exponent. One way to absorb this factor of 2 is to add a 0 to the right side of the binary number a2, a1, thereby getting a2, a1, 0. This is a simple maneuver. It's just the binary equivalent of what we do in base 10 when we multiply an integer by 10. We add a digit 0 on the right side. So for example, 10 times 23 is 230. 
Okay, now this is a very convenient way of writing the state f4 applied to the state ket a2 a1. Because if we now write the actual state that we want psi, we can see exactly where the difference is. For psi, the low order digit is a0. For f4, that low order digit is 0. We can even factor out that difference to get these two powers of omega. We'll refer to these as phase corrections. Their insertion has the effect of turning the f4 state into the correct state psi that we need. So based on this, we can devise a recursive strategy for computing f2 to the n in terms of f2 to the n minus 1. For f8, we can compute h of ket a0, that's the leftmost qubit, and also f4 of ket a2 a1, and somewhere in the process we insert the appropriate phase corrections. Let's see if we can make this work for f8. Here are the three input qubits in computational basis states, ket a2, ket a1, and ket a0, where a0 is the low order bit. First, we apply f4 to the two high order qubits, and here's the state we get. Next, we perform the phase corrections. Okay, some explanation of these gates is needed. These are two qubit gates that we call controlled phase gates. If the label is R, then the gate adds a phase of e to the 2 pi i over R to ket 1, 1, and does nothing to the other computational basis states. Here is the 4 by 4 matrix for such a gate. That matrix is the definition of the two qubit gate. The effect of these controlled phase gates is to insert the precise phase corrections that are needed to put the first two qubits into psi. You can see that when a0 is 0, nothing happens, but when a0 is 1, the ket1 term picks up the phase. So now the first two qubits are in the state psi. Let's go ahead and substitute psi for the first two qubits to reduce clutter. Next, we perform a Hadamard gate on the third qubit, which gives us the correct part of our desired state, h of ket a0. So far, so good, but the qubits are in the wrong order. The third qubit should be on the left side rather than on the right side. So we cyclically permute the qubits to get them into the required order. And the result of all this is the Fourier transform f8. So f8 can be computed in terms of f4 in this manner. This is what we just showed, and the general recursive result is the following. In order to compute f2 to the n, we compute the Fourier transform to the next lower power of 2, and then apply phase corrections, and then a Hadamard transform, and then rearrange the qubits so that the h of a0 is on the left side. This is straightforward to verify in the general case, along the lines of the n equals 3 case that we just did. To see explicitly how this recurrence works, suppose we want to compute f16. We can express f16 in terms of f8, like this, then f8 in terms of f4, then f4 in terms of f2, and f2 is just a Hadamard. So there's a circuit for f16. Notice that there are places where the qubits are rearranged. Instead of doing these rearrangements in the middle of the computation, we can just move the gates around. Then there's just one net rearrangement at the very end, which turns out to be a reversal of the order of the qubits. How do we perform this reversal? The reversal consists of around n over 2 2 qubit swap gates, where a swap gate is defined this way. In the computational basis, ket a ket b is mapped to 
ket B, ket A. It corresponds to this 4x4 four four matrix. How do we implement this? Intuitively, the notation for swap gates suggests that we physically move the qubits around. In principle, one could do that, but it would be nice not to be adding a brand new elementary operation into our repertoire of two qubit gates, if we can avoid it. It turns out that this swap gate can be computed by three controlled NOT gates, properly arranged. I leave it as an exercise for you to figure out how to do this. OK, let's tally up the gate cost for computing f2 to the n. There are n Hadamard gates, one for each qubit. The number of controlled phase gates can be seen to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n minus 1. The sum of this arithmetic series is around n squared over 2. So that's a quadratic number of gates and there are at most n over 2 swap gates, which translates into 3 n over 2 controlled NOT gates. That's a total of order n squared gates for computing the Fourier transform f2 to the n. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about how to compute the inverse Fourier transform f star 2 to the n with the same efficiency. It's not that hard, in fact, there are two approaches which lead to slightly different circuits. In the next lecture, we'll consider the phase estimation problem, a very powerful quantum algorithmic primitive for which this particular Fourier transform is ideally suited. And we'll end this lecture now.